Well, it's great to be back uh, with Jason Whitaker and Dean Lentini. Dean, the Grumpy Baptist, and Jason, <laughs> the Passionate Presbyterian. I, love I don't it. know. I love it. I love it. I don't think that's his official title, but I have to say, Jason. <laughs> yes, sir. For for my my concept of Presbyterians is that they tend to be people who are pretty reserved in, in general. That mm -hmm. maybe that's a misconception, but I mean, out of out of all the Presbyterians, no, you are the most where where your emotions on your sleeve Presbyterian I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> oh, cool. So that's why I'm dubbing you. The, I'm dubbing so. you the passionate Presbyterian, even though you've never taken that name. I'll for accept yourself. it. You accept it. Okay. I'll take the moniker. And yeah. uh, I don't have anything really for myself other than just the nerdy <laughs> Christian with a fresh perspective. <laughs> That's good. At least you're not grumpy. That works. That's right, right. <laughs> actually, Dean. I, I don't. I don't think of you as being very grumpy when I've met you. You. Mm -hmm. You actually. You maybe you maybe the grumpiness is internal. Maybe you just feel grumpy. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the day. So you'd have to oh, ask okay. my friends. It's. Oh man. It's nice to it's easy to be nice to the camera, you know. That's true. That's well, what it him. is. You know you're being there recorded. You. As soon Maybe. as we stop recording, the grumpiness is going to come I'm just going to let Jason have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, or or if uh if um his Disney, Disney Plus subscription runs out mid show, we'll see how grumpy he gets when oh, his yeah. kids come beating on the door. They they will. That's right. That's they gave right. secrets away, my friend. They need Bluey. Yeah. Gave secrets. It's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we have limited time actually as we're recording this because <laughs> Dean's children are uh, watching Disney Plus. He told us, and uh, hopefully their attention span will last long enough for us to get to a through a. I promise, I'm a good here. parent. <laughs> internet, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Hey, Disney Plus. That's that's good parenting. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's uh, there's definitely worse things out there, right? For sure. Yes, there but are. That's not that's not actually our topic. As that would be a good topic, uh, talking about all the different uh, media and uh, things that young people have at their disposal today to to watch. Um, what we're going to talk about are churches that are in the news, or churches that are getting some attention for things that are going on. <clears throat> And uh, I have to say, you know, I think you guys would agree. We are in a kind of a tumultuous time in, sure. uh, in recent years. And, and it seems like it's, it's just not letting up, you know, I, I feel like uh, there are so many things happening culturally that have just been heading in a direction. And then COVID, that whole situation almost uh, just threw gasoline on the fire and I think is continuing to do so. And uh, I don't know how things are up where you are, Dean. How are they up in Canada right now with uh, political things and such? Well, it is, uh, I don't know, it's getting a little worse. Like it seemed mm. like in the summer, you know, everything was looking on the up and up. And uh, then as we kind of winded things down and we got cases soaring again, a lot of divisiveness over politics we have an election coming up so they called an election which is they, it's not every four years uh up here it's just basically when they want to and so they wanted to really and so we got an election oh. coming up here in a couple of weeks so Two weeks, uh, yeah, yeah uh, we got a lot of decisions to be made as far as federal government goes um but yeah uh, as far as churches you know, not a whole lot in the news lately. Thank the Lord. <laughs> we got tired there for a while of just seeing another church, another pastor, another church, another pastor. So it's it's gotten a little quiet on that front, but I'm sure as uh, the cases go up, probably restrictions will be following here. At least in my province, it's been wide open pretty much all summer. Um, but yeah, so there'll, there'll probably be some more coming down the way. It will be interesting to see if what happened before with some of the church government conflict will uh, somehow have an impact on how those things are dealt with in the coming months. If maybe the government will be a little bit more accommodating to churches. I don't know. I know here in the United States, the courts have really ultimately backed up the churches. 
uh, which yeah. has been really useful here, really helpful here. So I think mm -hmm. governments here are going to be much more careful in the United States about uh, any super tight restrictions on churches. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's different in Canada. I agree. Yeah, I would say that it is. It's definitely different. Uh, you know, we don't have the constitution to fall back on and rely on that. You know, we do have uh, certain rights, uh, a charter of rights, um, but there's a lot of uh, talk amongst politicians and judges on how far those go in these kinds of uh, emergency scenarios. So, yeah, there's going to be some decisions in courts here in the next couple months that it's going to kind of set the precedent for probably a couple decades up here. So we'll, we'll see. Praying, hopefully, you know, we can continue on doing ministry as we would love to. Uh, but it's going to be interesting for sure. Yeah. And, and I think with all of this stuff going on, people's tensions have just gone higher and higher. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing. And, and so with churches, we're seeing this actually affect not just the churches like we were, we have been discussing with uh, them staying open during COVID and that whole, that whole uh, decision and, and all of that, but, but also just, just things that are happening in the culture right now uh, and, and churches having to deal with so much. I feel like there are a lot of things as church leaders that we have to navigate. It's like there's quite a minefield today for church leaders to, to navigate. And that's always the case to some degree. I mean, mm -hmm. we're obviously called to a, to a spiritual battle, so it's not like it's ever going to be easy. But I can tell there are things that are really straining on churches and I feel like, uh, if I could put it this way, there's a lot of evangelical disorientation these days. And so I'm hoping our like conversation, that. what we talk about, will kind of orient us a little bit. U ultimately, what we're always trying to do, and I know, Dean, you do this too, it, you know, it's trying to get us back to the Word, trying to get us back to Scripture, focus on the Lord. And that's, uh, that's what we've got to do. The Scripture tells us to keep our eyes on Jesus. And so th that's so important. It's especially important in the time like this that we're in right now. So I definitely uh, want to, you know, talk with you guys about some of these different things. And we're not going to get into super deep detail on these churches. But Dean on his channel, Dean Lentini, go to his YouTube channel, subscribe to his channel. He's got great content. And uh, you've been it. talking about some different situations. Uh, and so... Uh, you're actually planning to do like a live show, I think you said on Monday, and you're going to actually give people the opportunity to talk with you live. Yeah, that's that's the plan. I've always kind of had this in my mind of doing a weekly theology show where we just sit down and talk theology and with that talk about theological discussions that are going on throughout the week. It's always been something that I've wanted to do, uh, but when, you know, you got like 12 subscribers, uh, you do a live show, you're just going to be talking to yourself for a while. So uh, now, you know, kind of built up the channel a little bit. So uh, now we can get to what I really want to do, which is, yeah, just having discussions with people. So the first one I'm hoping is going to be Monday uh, and uh, it's going to be in the afternoon. Uh, I'll be putting up a uh, you know, a thumbnail announcement for it, uh, on my channel. So go over there and subscribe and, uh, you'll get a notification when we end up doing that. It will be when I can have my baby napping Monday afternoon. So it's going to be up in the air a little bit, probably one o'clock, but, uh, no bluey on, on Monday. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's the plan right now. I'm calling it Theo live because I just, I just like that. My wife said that's a dumb name, but, you know, I'm just going with it. <laughs> with, it's the best you could come it. up with. Right? <laughs> yeah. And if it, if it doesn't work, you can always come up with something else. But it stands for Theology Live. Not, yeah. it's, it has Nailed nothing it. to do with, yes. Well, I watched your video. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I would have that guessed sense. that. And you do have a shirt there that indicates you're into theology, right. I see. Right. Yes. That's not actually Just a little bit. shirt. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we're going to talk theology here. All right. Uh, so one of the churches that you highlighted, Dean, on your channel was Mars Hill. And I think there has been, an, is it a podcast, I believe, called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill? Yes. 
Wow. And who put who put out that podcast? I actually haven't listened to it. Okay. Um, really well, good. I think you might be the only one, Tim. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's put out by Christianity Today. And uh, Mike Cosper is the main guy behind it. Uh, you might know him from uh, his book, uh, Rhythms of Grace. That was a pretty good one. I think Crossway put it out uh, a couple years back. But he was a church planter, big into Acts 29. Uh, so he was he was in that group. And so um, he decided to tell the story of Mars Hill. And, uh, you know, people are interested. People want to know what happened uh, there in Seattle. Uh, you know, for me, it's a very personal story as well, because I grew up in Seattle, uh, kind of in the shadow of Mars Hill, uh, had a lot of friends who went to Mars Hill, people who were, uh, part of like the planting team, uh, for Mars Hill. So, uh, a lot of, a lot of roots there in Seattle for a lot of people. And, uh, then I think it's, you know, it's also, an interesting story just for Christians. And I think it actually speaks to the, the broader scope of evangelicalism right now with uh, issues with, you know, authoritative leadership and how much authority should they have in the congregants life. And then also, you know, how does character go into that? You know, are they qualified authorities for someone to have in their life? Um, you know, do they meet that biblical qualification in First Timothy chapter three? Uh, so it's it's an interesting conversation. Um, you know, some some people are not happy with it because they think it's you know getting close to gossip or maybe is gossip. Um, but I think it's important for us to know what happened at this pretty influential church and uh, you know the ripple effects. I mean, you even getting into like Acts 29 and the church planting network. I mean, the, the connections that, I mean, just the average Christian has, uh, to Mars Hill. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, what is it like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, where you can just kind of go through and say, all right, you know, this person, this person, this person, they're connected to Kevin Bacon. It's, it's kind of like that with Mars Hill. I think all of us have some kind of connection to him, whether it's through like a, a church planter uh that you know passed through their church or you know read his books or watched his sermons you know one of the first guys to upload uh here on youtube you know his sermons and all of that i think it's important for all of us to kind of figure out you know what happened there and is that still happening in the church today Mm, yeah so definitely it sounds like a good podcast to check out and like you said it's it's not really about uh stirring up gossip i mean this is actually old news all of this stuff it's it's more just trying to do kind of a post-mortem uh to to figure out you know what went wrong and what can we learn from these things so yeah we're not going to get into all the nitty-gritty there but i guess i i some themes that come to my mind when i think of mars hill and i'd love to hear your guys thoughts on this one of them has to do with well, obviously, a lot has to do with Mark Driscoll himself, <laughs> sure. yeah. and uh, we could have a very long discussion about him. But you know, th- the thing about Mark Driscoll, one, he he was one of these, I guess you could call celebrity figures, and I think that's one theme that we've got to always be thinking about. Um, how should we deal with this issue of celebrityism and i actually think in our circles the the i i don't know jason it feels to me like in presbyterianism where you have such a good clear structural system it actually helps avoid celebrityism i'm yeah. sure presbyterians do have their celebrities i know they do but i still think most of celebrities are dead but yes <laughs> <laughs> most of them are true. dead but yes that's true that i i see what you're saying yes but, um, but yeah, in, in, in the Baptist and non-denominational circles, it's so easy for a, a leader to just gain more and more attention and a bigger and bigger following. And I think being in the internet age, that is actually, you know, magnified. And I think that certainly happened with Mark Driscoll. So that's uh, an issue. Uh, but also I want to tie it into uh, something else I noticed about Mark Driscoll. It's a good thing and a bad thing, I think, uh, it's the issue of, uh, you know, male headship, and right? Because we are talking about a very strong leader, 
Mm -hmm. And that's good. Like there's a sense in which we're called as men to be leaders biblically, but are there dangers? You know, we can't just take that as because we're men, we can do whatever we want because we're the man and yeah. we're, we're in charge, right? So what are some thoughts that come to you biblically that would help with some of the things we saw with Mark Driscoll's leadership? And if you had any ideas that you were already planning to share, you can throw them in there. But, but uh, do either of you have any thoughts on, on themes related to what I'm talking about here? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean... I, I think when we're talking about like this celebrity aspect, um, I think that there, there is a, an issue that I think Baptists and non-denominational churches are a little bit more prone to versus uh, maybe like a higher view of church, people who are more uh, liturgical uh, about, you know, their structure and their worship experience. Um, one of the problems that arises is a focus on the pulpit. And that might, that might get you a little riled up just hearing that. But uh, the problem with that versus like the high view of church, which would be more of like the focus on like uh, the Lord's, uh, the Lord's table communion uh, and like that, like there's like the pulpit and the communion table. And depending on really on what you focus on and Baptists and non-denominational churches would more focus on the pulpit. There's, there is a danger of focusing on the guy behind that pulpit rather than on the word of God being properly, um, properly communicated to his people. Uh, so I think that would be one of the dangers. I don't know if Jason would agree with that, you know, coming from more of a Presbyterian background. Maybe got, he's waiting. He's waiting. I got some. He's I gonna... got some. I don't know. I just I I think because I have um during the podcast there's a an extra bonus episode called I Kiss Christianity Goodbye. Sure. And it's um, contrasting Josh Harris and Mark Driscoll and how they overlap doing the six degrees of separation. I didn't realize there was so much a connection between. Josh Harris and, and um, Mark Driscoll. But something I noticed in both of their stories is that they just, they, they jumped onto the scene. And I really believe that they violated a lot of, of uh, First Timothy chapter three. If you just look at the, the qualifications mm -hmm. of a pastor and they were, they were, I didn't realize how they shuttled uh, Josh Harris out there. He was preaching like at 18, he was still in high school preaching like, and, and I mean, he, he had no business doing that. He had no business doing that. But because he wrote a, a hot book that really got the homeschoolers and the purity culture really up in, up in a tizzy, they just kind of pushed him out there. Same thing with Mark Driscoll. I'm not saying that they're not good communicators. I'm not saying that they weren't um, effervescent or any of that kind of stuff. But it did lead to what you're saying here, Dean, that it took all the focus off of God, all the focus off the word into this person. And then as Mark says it, in one of the episodes of Mars Hill, the brand. Yeah. And I think that's, a, so though I, I think that we should focus on the pulpit and that being what's being preached from the pulpit, God's word primarily um, should be what's being exalted, not who is speaking, but on the same note, who's speaking needs to be qualified to be up there to be speaking. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I was listening to, I was like, the stuff that Josh Harris said in that book really wasn't bad. I mean, it was maybe it wasn't the best. It was a lot of of law, if you will, but uh, and and do this stuff to to create piety. But at the end of the day, like it really wasn't that bad in light of the culture that we were that we were in and the cultural revolution that I think he wrote that in response to. But you know, that's neither here nor there. He still shouldn't have been preaching it though. Still shouldn't have been preaching in a pulpit. Should he have been under a pastor, being mentored, going to the, um going to seminary? Maybe so. The man didn't go to seminary until he decided to stop being a pastor almost. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it was a he had not been in formal, he had not been in a formal education environment until he had already been a pastor for quite some time because he had been homeschooled. And once he graduated from homeschool, he was out there leading and soon being a pastor. So there was a lot of problems. I I see with Mark as well as um Josh Harris, right from First Timothy chapter three. If we just walk down this, I think we could see a lot 
of, of issues that should have been called onto the carpet by, and I thought it was, it was, it was interesting that Mark Driscoll actually had systems in place that could have checked and balanced him. He had systems in place. I, I've said it before on other episodes about purpose driven does not allow for a real checks and balance system. Mark Driscoll actually had elders who could have done their jobs, who could have called them on the carpet and such like that. But by the time they were actually said, hey, there's something wrong with the bylaws. There's something wrong with, with this. It was too late. The machine was already entirely too big. And he, or the bus, and he ran them yeah. over. So I, I just wanted to point that out. I do agree that the, the pulpit should not, I, I believe the pulpit should be the, the focus, but it's what's being said, not who is saying it. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, and you could probably parse out, distinguish between the pulpit and, and the person, although obviously, you know, it is a person behind the pulpit. But I think what we're saying is in some of our circles, it's very much personality centered. And, and oh, for that's sure. different than being pulpit centered, right? Because that's the correct. pulpit is about the word. And as long as that's the focus, then, that, then that's good. But it can so easily become about the person. Mm -hmm. and and focus more on who it is and and so that's one of the things what i hear jason saying though actually this fits in right with your background jason your or your uh, affiliation that you're presbyterian and the the word in the bible presbyteros mm -hmm. right uh, i'm i'm guessing you know what it means did they teach you what it means yeah. And they may have, they might have. Yeah. We yeah. use it in understanding of the of the the overseer and the process of a presbytery overseeing. So um yeah. so inside of my church we have elders and they, they make up the um the overseeing body, then we have the presbytery that's the overseeing body over our church, and then the the larger assembly, the general assembly that oversees all of them. Yes. And Dean, what are your thoughts on that word presbyteros? Yeah. I mean, I agree. It's overseeing. It is the, I, what I, what I hear when I think about this is meaningful accountability. Like with Jason, with your church, you have meaningful accountability amongst the pastors there. You know, they, they have other elders to check and balance them. Uh, but then you also have, you know, this higher authority uh, with the, the presbytery, that is another form of accountability. You know, you were, you were talking about, um, Mars Hill and how Mark Driscoll had that he had elders that were there to hold him accountable. Uh, but then the, the question then becomes, is it meaningful accountability? And I think with Driscoll, what happened there is you're listening to the podcast, other people might have different perspectives, but for me, as I'm hearing it, he had built this culture uh, of just trampling people who would oppose him. I mean, even like the story of his secretary, uh, you know, saying, saying yes. one thing that she just wishes that there was, you know, another older guy who could speak into Driscoll's life and immediately fired, you know, <laughs> like uh, that, that kind of fear culture. Right. That's problematic. I, yeah, it, it makes it so that those who are on the same level as you, you know, they're not really, they, it might be on paper, uh, but you've built this culture that is so focused on one individual that when that one individual mm -hmm. does something and other people might know it's wrong, they just go with it because like, like he said, like you said, they don't want to get ran over by the bus. Uh, so I think it's uh, this idea of having oversight is yes it's accountability for the the elders to have you know the members accountable and to hold them accountable mm -hmm. but also to have accountability within themselves as the elder board or uh you know in the presbyterian experience of having the presbytery uh so i don't see that in a lot of these stories you know whether yes. it's mars hill or mm -hmm. the other ones Meaningful accountability is kind of thrown out the window. And I was going to say some similar things, Dean. Uh, where I was going, though, with the word presbyteros is actually uh, the definition, uh, which you can see here, the outline of biblical usage. And uh, it is, yeah, presbyteros. And mm -hmm. 
it it means elder of age, advanced in life. <laughs> so um, where I was really going with that, it, it, and the reason I asked about that specific word is we kind of just get so used to hearing elder, we don't think about what that actually means. Oh, no. it, it means someone who's mature. And that came to my mind as Jason was talking about Josh Harris. And it's like, again, in some of our circles, if someone is a great communicator, we automatically associate that with maturity. And those are not the same things. Sure. And even someone like Mark Driscoll, there were signs, I, I believe, of immaturity, uh, areas that very clearly you could see from the outside, like the, the way he talked sometimes, it's like, is that really reflecting someone who's mature in the Lord? I haven't seen him a lot lately, but I would imagine that today he probably evidences more maturity than he did 10 years ago. Maybe I'm wrong. You're looking, Jason, like maybe I'm wrong on that. Is he, is he not more mature? Some of the things I've heard are just a little interesting. But, okay, um, so there you go. I mean, maybe the, these are just problems that he continues to struggle with. But I felt like even 15 or 10 years ago, however long ago, there were things that people pointed out that yep. clearly, you know. But you're right. What I heard Jason also talking about, and Dean, when, when you talked about accountability too, he had things in place, but this is such a lesson for all of us. At the end of the day, it's not what's on paper. It's what we put into practice. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. one of the hard things about leadership is confrontation, but mm -hmm. you've got to do it. Even if it's someone who is a powerful, you know, especially if they're powerful, right? You know, you, oh, yeah. you've got Absolutely. to say, we're ultimately, like Peter said, we're, we're, um, you know, we're, we're serving the, 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 over, the, the chief shepherd, Jesus, mm -hmm. right? We're not the chief shepherd. So no one on this earth is the chief shepherd in, in, in the ultimate sense. We're yeah. all under the headship of Christ. And Mark Driscoll, now we, of course, look back and say, well, shouldn't he have been held to that accountability? Yes, but the hard thing is putting that into practice. So, um, yeah, I totally agree with what you guys are saying. And I think for us, if we're in a leadership position, if we are that lead pastor uh, or a teaching elder or something like that, we have to really strive for humility to let people hold us accountable. And if they tell us something, we've got to be willing to listen. But if we're not the lead, we've got to be willing to, to hold those people accountable right off the bat. Like you said, Jason, yeah. you can't let it get too big. <laughs> you, you got, you know, it's like, any sin, you've got to stamp it out early on because it's not going to get smaller. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so, so we've solved the problem of Mars Hill with <laughs> Did it. Check it off. <laughs> Check it off. Problem now, solved. A couple, couple churches that I think there's some similar things uh, in terms of cultural situations uh, is McLean Bible Church and Bethlehem Baptist Church because they're both dealing with really just, I think, <clears throat> trying to sort through some of the cultural things we're going through right now. And uh, Dean, you have talked about both of these churches as well. And so I'd like to talk, again, not to get in, into the nitty gritty of, of their situations, but what are, what are the things that they as churches have gone through? And is there anything we can be thinking about instead of just looking at them and saying, uh, you know, that's horrible. Uh, but actually saying, Lord, you know, obviously there's a lot going on in our culture right now. How can we navigate this in a God honoring way? And, you know, Lord willing not see church splits and not see, uh, you know, all kinds of dirty laundry aired out on uh, yeah. social or media. Members suing the their church. We yeah. About. Yeah. Yeah. So, so do, do you agree, Dean, that those church situations, I don't know if, if I'm being clear enough, that there are things they are dealing with that have to do with uh, cultural issues. And if I say a certain phrase, it's going to take this conversation down a rabbit sure. hole. Yeah. But I'm talking about even things that tie into politics right I, if i can be a little general <laughs> now i talk right 
Sure. Do you think there's some relationship in what both churches are going to uh, going through? Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, I look at it as a reflection of our culture. Like I think these, these two examples of these churches, yes, there are unique situations and unique things are happening there. But I mean, a lot of what's coming out is, I mean, North America, it's, it's all the issues with, uh, you know, certain themes that, that maybe we don't want to get into, but uh, I would totally agree that those things are there. Um, what I'm seeing in these stories, and again, like Mars Hill, I felt like I, I had more familiarity. I knew a lot of those people, you know, like there's more of a connection. I, I am not aware of everything that's gone on uh, at these two scenarios. Uh, so I don't want to sound like I'm the expert or anything, but what I'm getting out of it is that these, these things that are happening in culture that people are struggling with are bringing out issues that the elders in these churches or the leadership in these churches uh, would have to deal with anyways. And I think that, you know, the, the cultural issues are more of like, it's like adding heat to, uh, you know, water that's boiling. Uh, so I don't see them, at least from what I've read, you know, and I could be wrong. This is just my own, you know, um, reading of the situation. I don't see those as like the, the main issues in these churches, at least as far as what people who are hurt are bringing up. I see, once again, that meaningful accountability being like the main issue in these churches, you know, whether it's Bethlehem with uh, issues being raised against faculty and pastors and, you know, issues of, you know, just being gentle, uh, of being kind, you know, the biblical qualifications of, of not being a brawler, which I think is more than just, you know, punching someone out. Uh, but I think it speaks to the, the gentle spirit of an individual who would be uh, a, a qualified elder. Um, so I think that that's the situation with that one. And then when you look over at McLean, uh, it honestly is a mess. Uh, I, I still don't know exactly what to think of everything. Uh, but what I see is uh, members not being on the same page with the leadership and the leadership just at least seemingly not caring or not dealing with those situations. And then, you know, emotions get out of hand and then you get a crazy business meeting. Right. Uh, so like I, I view it as accountability for leadership. Um, but you know, that's, that's just my perspective. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of, um, you know, what's going on at these individual churches. Uh, but, you know, reading the Christianity today article for, uh, Bethlehem Baptists, and then, you know, watching the videos from, I think it was capstone, media who put it out for uh mclean bible church and the and the business meetings that were going on and everything it's mm -hmm. that's my reading of the situation okay jason were you itching to say something on this well i don't know much about bethlehem baptist so i'll just speak to mclean and i think that dean makes a great summary of it so much could be done to well first of all let me back up I don't think that the culture should dictate how the church responds. The church, because we are the body of Christ, we stand counter-cultural no matter what. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't address cultural issues that do try to get in or that do actually make their way into the church, but they shouldn't dictate, like they shouldn't drive the church's agenda, so to speak. Um, the, Christ is the head of the church and he drives, he directs the, the church. So that being the case, I think what we've seen at McLean is countless examples of doctrines and teachings and ideas coming in and being embraced. They get to sit down in the pews. Sometimes they sing in the praise band. Sometimes they're ushering. Lo and behold, they're in the pulpit. And now they're, those cultural issues start running the church and start leading the church. And then there's people who are offended, people who feel like they're not being heard and authorities being denied, so on and so forth, and it's causing division. When you look in the scriptures and when Paul writes about divisions, it's not because uh, Dean is standing on God's word or Tim is being like, hey, the Bible says this. 
That's not what causes division. What causes division is outside the outside ideology, outside teaching. So if I bring in some kind of shady teaching into the church and Dean is like, no, we're not going to do that. It might look like there's some division, but it's not because of Dean. Or it's not because of Tim standing up to it. It's because of me bringing in the faulty teaching. And I think what we've seen here is just that that teaching wasn't quashed right at the door or wasn't addressed in a way that properly dealt with it and didn't allow it to take front, become front and center. Because I think that's what we saw at the McLean um, um, elders meeting. I, I pray and I wish that they would just find a way to, to resolve that. I mean, going to, going to court is just ugly. Not saying it's not that they don't have the right to do it. It's just ugly. Um, you know, the secret cam videos of, of out of control uh, congregational meetings, that's the Christ isn't honored in that. I mean, and, and all it does is just makes the church look just like, you know, oh, this is just the same old yahoos that are at the bar, the same old yahoos that are at the football game or at Kroger. They're just like everybody else. There's nothing different. This whole thing about being in Christ, it's nothing new. It's nothing different. So I, I wish they would consider that like how are we presenting christ as, as how are we presenting his church his bride to the world and why would they want to be a part of this when we tell them to repent and believe the gospel if we're behaving just like they are and they're not repentant and they don't believe the gospel so yeah uh, well that's, that's just my little two cents that's an old problem because actually oh, yeah. paul said to the corinthians you're behaving in a carnal manner you're behaving mm -hmm. like normal people, right? Instead of behaving like the Christians that that God is is making you to be. And yes, I, let me let me just say something. I think that though it is kind of like, man, they were dealing with this two thousand years ago. I think it's also encouraging because guess what? They were dealing with it two thousand years ago. So, mm -hmm. but Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote directions on how to deal with this. So though. Like, man, we still doing the same thing they're doing. Well, guess what? We still have the same directions and the same remedy and the same solution that they did too. So it's, it, it's not like it's something new. Thank God that there is nothing new under the sun. And we can look back at God's word and we can actually get direction on how to deal with these fine details that we think are so brand new. Like, oh, this is this has never happened before in the history of hum humanity. Yeah, it has. <laughs> and we can deal with it and we can get direction from God's word. And we don't have to try to, you know, foot freestyle it, so to speak. But that was just something I noticed as well. Yeah. And what I will say to all this is that uh, I appreciate listening to both of you guys because I, I think, first of all, you know, we we should all remember that we're we're looking at these things from a distance. And my my church, yeah. I think every church goes through its things. Uh, we as humans go through things that if people are looking from the outside, they really never know the whole situation. Furthermore, we, I know for me, I hardly can understand myself. Only the Lord really knows me. The, the one thing I will say that I, I do kind of, and I'm, I'm reminded of in these situations is, and I think Dean, some things you said reminded me of it, you know, there's this uh, sense of, of leadership not seeming to care. And I think that reminds us as leaders that we have to, it's, it's not enough just to say, I, I have this teaching that the Lord is, is leading me with, and I, and I want to I lead people. I can think of uh, pastors who go to conferences. We've all, you know, been there as pastors. And it's easy to come back from a conference and say, I know exactly what I need to tell these people to do. But right. the truth is that the scripture tells us not to lord it over the flock. We're, we're right. not to be these taskmasters that just tell the church, even if we are making a good point, we have to think of relationship first. And again, another biblical word is pastor uh, or shepherd. It, wh what do shepherds do? I mean, they, they feed sheep. They care for sheep. They take care of sheep. They have a lot of you know, the sense of uh, these sheep need, need, need support and help. They, and so that's the kind of attitude we have to have. And of course, as humans, 
we we do want to lord it over people like that's a human thing but i think what i'm being reminded of in all this one is that we have to focus on relationship because that's what i see happening right now in our culture that's what's seeping in partly into the church is all this divisiveness and how does the scripture tell us to relate to each other not to go on twitter and tell everybody else what the, how bad this person is but to go first to a person and to work it out with that person and if that doesn't work you know you can bring other people with you and then bring it before the church here's the other thing i'm thinking though because i know some of this stuff has been tried but the other thing I, I i have to admit jason if there's any time that i'm drawn to the church structure that i see with presbyterians it's it's times like these because I do think uh, the autonomy of churches today just reinforces some of these problems where you have a leader that certain people don't like, and instead of working it out, they just go to the next church, and and you or, just see division, division, division. Or I don't like you guys, so I'm gonna go over here and start my own church. That too, because I know I, I can do a better job than. In Pastor Tim or Pastor Dean, so I'm just gonna go over and start my own my own situation. So yeah, I agree. So one of the things we've got to do, I believe, then, especially if we're not in really structured systems like like uh, Jason's in the Presbyterian system, we have to we have to have those kinds of uh, relationships with other pastors because I do believe other pastors can even outside of our local church can sometimes say, you know what? And I've done it. I've actually had the opportunity sometimes to help people reconcile who actually were in another church because I was on the outside, but had a relationship. And so I think, that, you know, it's biblical, right? I mean, the early church, how did they sort out their differences? They all got together and they worked these things out, right? So... All right, so we've solved the problem of McLean and Bethlehem. <laughs> Man, check and double check. And we're just the, uh, lining them up, knocking them down. Tonight. Yeah, the, the last church is a little different. Uh, this church hasn't oh, had any uh, scandals per se, but it's definitely a church in the news, uh, Grace Community Church. And I reported, I've reported quite a bit on Grace Community Church with Pastor John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously so many people uh, love and respect uh, Pastor MacArthur's um, just incredible amount of teaching and writing that he's done for many years. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good to be said, of course, about Pastor MacArthur, but uh, he has taken a certain path and stance when it comes to COVID. And uh, that in and of itself has had mixed reactions. Some people agreed with Pastor MacArthur. Some people didn't think the way he was not only handling it, but the way he was talking about it. But furthermore, most recently, I reported on him actually saying recently at church that he did have COVID and his wife had it and a lot of other people at church had it. And I probably wouldn't even bring it up except for the fact that I've been looking at the comments and seeing a lot of people bothered by that. And so I think this, again, is another area. And again, the, the point of this isn't so much to get in the nitty gritty as to whether Pastor MacArthur was right or not or whatever, but just that we are dealing right now with Christians who have different uh, approaches than we do and how that can, you know, uh, kind of cause us to look at things through a certain lens, sure. depending on our view. And I think the, the what I'm noticing is the people that think COVID, and Jason and I have talked about COVID quite a bit, actually, who, who think that the, uh, the government and the medical community at large are really doing everything in our best interests, would look at Pastor MacArthur as, you know, being wrong. And then other people look at Pastor MacArthur and what he did as, as being right. Uh, and, and then you think of, I don't know if you guys even heard or saw anything on this, but I did talk about it, uh, Todd Friel and 
uh, James White have both talked about how do we look at things like government mandates, which is now starting to become a reality with vaccines. So I'm throwing all this out there because of course we can't make everybody agree on this, but my question is, what do we need to do to make sure we don't let these things uh, divide us unnecessarily? And how, how do you guys look at someone like Pastor MacArthur when you see what's happening? So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, not whether you agree with him, but just how you kind of respond. How do you react? Does it bother you? Or are you kind of like, oh, I don't, I don't really have a strong opinion? Or I just want to kind of get your thoughts on Grace Community Church and, and how they've done everything. Man, just laying it all out there, Tim. Uh, I've got a lot and of feelings, have, to be you honest. You have one minute to give your entire yeah, No, right? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got the time. Um, we'll make the time. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting scenario because for me, like, I'm biased towards Johnny Mac. I grew up on Johnny Mac. Like, my pastor was always bringing up John MacArthur. Uh, I have dozens of his books, dozens of his commentaries, you know, even like his little Bible studies on certain verses. You know, I've got all that. I grew up on it. Um, I, I have greatly benefited from his ministry, you know, like most pastors, I guess. Um, so I, I love Johnny Mac. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm up here in Canada and like you might suspect from someone up in Canada, uh, I have a different view of the lockdowns than maybe the other people, uh, specifically in the United States and, you know, different brothers up here have differed on it as, as well. So, uh, that's all fine. Um, so I, I have taken a little offense at John MacArthur's tone. You know, for me, I, I, I view it differently than up here, uh, just in that, like, like I, I was talking before the show and everything with the constitution versus the charter of rights and, you know, different scenarios for different, uh, different things going on. Um, so like for the stand that he took against COVID, that's fine. Like, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily agree with everything, but you know, that's fine. Uh, I don't view that as anything, but the tone that he took of, you know, this whole thing isn't real. Essentially, is what he said, or at least it's not, it's not nearly as dangerous as what, you know, you've been led to believe. And then to find out that he had it and his wife had it and it went through the church when, I mean, there were people, I mean, I don't want to like just throw someone under the bus, but I'm pretty sure Phil Johnson went on Twitter and said, all this is untrue back, you know, when like he, cause he took his leave of absence, like in like February, something like that. Right. Uh, he was, he was gone for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and everyone was yeah, like, what's like going that. on. And uh, you know, Phil Johnson or someone, someone from the church. So maybe it wasn't Phil, uh, but someone came up and said, you know, Oh, it, all is fine. Don't be gossiping or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So now I'm looking at that and being like, Oh, mm -hmm. you know, that that's not great. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, for, for me, like we just had uh, a friend of the family, like, very close friend of the family died last week from COVID. Like we, it's, it's a real experience that a lot of people are going through. And I don't like the belittling of that. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing to take your stand and say, this is, you know, uh, the church needs to stay open, you know, all these kinds of things, or even to say, like, I don't agree with the narrative that's being pushed by media, you know, all those kinds of um, talking points. I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, different people are going to have different perspectives. People who are going to comment on this video are going to have different perspectives. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but to belittle the experience of brothers and sisters who are suffering, I, I don't like that. Uh, and then when all this comes out, it, it does, it, it rubs me the wrong way. I'll just say that. Okay. okay. I appreciate your honesty there and, and kind of um, speaking into the conversation uh, you know, candidly from your perspective. I think that that's good. What about you, Jason? Okay. Well, I'm, you know, team Johnny Mac as well. I, I enjoy his sermons. I enjoy 
his books, probably not as many books as Dean, but I totally get down with those. Um, however, I, I think speaking to the tone issue alone, John MacArthur has very rarely parsed words or been very gray. I think that's been the thing that's actually caused him to, to be able to stand so long is that he says something and it's going to probably be the exact same thing next Tuesday. It'll be the same thing a month from now. Now, granted, I'm sure he's backtracked on some things, but for the most part, I think he, he's, he's been very faithful at just saying this is what it is or how he felt. Again, how I might disagree sure. with that or you might disagree with that. And like you said, the comment section disagrees with us, but we got to at least give him credit. The man doesn't parse words. He's, he's, he wouldn't make a good politician because he would tell you exactly what he's going to do. And the likelihood is that he would do exactly what he says. So a lot of people like politicians because they don't, they tell them what they, what they want to hear or what they think they heard. And then they go do something else anyway. So a lot of people, why a lot of people don't like John MacArthur is because of that. Not, not arguing or disagreeing with you at all, Dean. I do understand. Um, I, do I wish they had addressed this issue a little bit better? I, absolutely. However, however, the, to the Todd Friel, um, James White shenanigans, shenanigans. Um, we, we, we call them the Romans 13 crowd, everybody, because everybody seems to interpret Romans 13 differently. You know, do we do everything the government says? Do we do nothing that the government says? Do we do some of the things the government says? I think, I, it, I, I think we could parse that out. But I want people, I want to encourage people to read Romans 14. So get Romans 13, read it, and just go on over, flip the, turn the page to Romans 14 and read what Paul is talking about. Do not cause it, not call it, calling, causing your brother to stumble and not passing judgment on one another. I really think that's really helps us to properly look at Romans 13. So though Dean might, I disagree with Dean about wearing that red shirt. He's wearing that red shirt. I have good reason to believe anybody wearing a red shirt should be kicked out of moose jaw um, with prejudice. They should be put in the coldest place in Canada, period, forever. Okay, but and we should make a law that says that. We should make a law that says that. The government should do this to anybody that wears a red shirt. Well, let's go now. You've already made your case, Jason. Now, why don't you go to Romans 14 and see how you apply Romans 14 considering what you just said, foolishness about the red shirt. Well, I don't need to pass judgment on Dean and I shouldn't cause him to stumble. I shouldn't go telling Tim how terrible a person Dean is because Dean wears a red shirt and try to cause Tim to stumble in, into that as well. Actually, I'm a little actually jealous about the red shirt. So, I mean, that's what it I is. It up. So, truthfully, that's, that's why I keep bringing up some kind of jealous. But at the end of the day, Just I think we should, we should, yeah, we're, we're going to duke this out in the, in the pale of or, orthodoxy till Christ comes back. So whatever the next big hugabaloo is in the, in the nation or in the world or just in the church in general, Romans 13, Romans 14 is going to come up. But I think we should really take God's word seriously and just consider like, okay, like, does that mean we follow all laws? Of course not. I, I, I just, I, I disagree with Todd Friel on that, that whole kerfuffle. I'm, I'm more, I'm, I guess I'm more uh, Doug Wilson in that regard. Like they can't just make up laws and you just follow them <laughs> without without some level of pushback or even question asking. So um, uh, that's that's where I'm at. Well, I appreciate that. That was a very hard thing I brought up because there was a lot of pieces to it. You did. <laughs> and you had, <laughs> yeah, you had to kind of pick. Yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> now I have uh, clips that I can take and of both of you that I can I can I love it. put on on social media out of context. Make put, it it. On <laughs> put it on I'll TikTok. Put it on TikTok. Yes, on miss me with that foolishness. Uh, the, Dot com. The I love it. Yeah, I uh, wish I could yes. make that. <laughs> well, I I uh, I don't have a simple answer. I've had uh, some videos trying to talk about it. Let me, let me try to close off our whole conversation, though, with this. We've talked a lot about leaders, and maybe some people out there are in churches, and you're like, yeah, leaders need to be better. But there's also uh, something to be said for, for church members, and that is mm -hmm. your leaders are human. <laughs> and the scripture even tells us to pray for worldly leaders, to pray for people in authority, because... Mm -hmm. 
we need it. And, and I would say as pastors, we need your prayers. And so when I look at, you know, a, a situation like Grace Community, of course, yeah, people are going to say things that people are going to take in different ways and leaders are not always going to be perfect. That's for sure. I think that's been a theme of tonight. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't be accountable. We've made it very mm -hmm. clear that leaders right. should be accountable, but as church members, we should also have sympathy for our leaders and realize that they deal with things that the average church person doesn't deal with a lot of times. So that's important to keep in mind. And also I'm sure there's a spiritual element there that when you're leading a church, obviously there's a spiritual battle there. And so pray for your leaders who are, you know, in the midst of that spiritual battle and seeking to help you as a church member in the spiritual battle and honor them as leaders. And the scripture tells us that, right? Recognize those who are leaders and, and show honor to them. So make sure uh, we do that. But I hope that what we've said tonight reminds us that it's not easy to be a leader today. Uh, there, there are a lot of pitfalls and things that we're dealing with. And it's always hard to be a leader, but there are, uh, especially right now, specific things we're going through and dealing with. Yeah. The other thing I'm hoping for and praying for is that we're, we're having conversations like this. We didn't even tonight totally agree on every little minute detail, but I encourage Christians to be biblical in their relationships and talk with people biblically. And even if you have a disagreement, you know, try to do that, try to deal with that disagreement in a biblical way. And I feel like that's my it's, burden. What I'm seeing today sometimes is people are dealing with disagreements in ways that I don't think are, are, are biblical or at least not entirely biblical. And so we need to work on that too. But that's always the case. We always got to work yeah. on these things. Anyway, uh, it has been really good talking to both of you. Uh, a, a fellow Baptist oh, always fun. there up in Canada, <laughs> but uh, getting that, that actually, Jason, I think you could agree. Uh, we had a lot of good things to say about Presbyterianism tonight. Right. Man, I have nothing bad to say about Baptists at all. Nothing. No, so no. I, 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 I agree just, with you guys. Well, how I actually you? think, I think we, we, we actually kind of showed some of, some of the benefits tonight of the Presbyterian huh. structure. Yeah. And well, uh, yeah, so we're, we're trying to, we're trying to be uh, humble and trying to, to, to be uh, honest about when we see uh, something that, that is good, even in a, uh, a denomination outside of our own. But uh, I do appreciate both I'm, of you taking this time. To, appreciate you guys. Yeah. Appreciate both of you yeah, taking the fun. time to talk about these things. And I hope Always that fun. Dean, you'll come on again. And uh, join us sometime yeah. to talk about maybe uh, the subject of parenting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. If they're still live up there. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, that could be that's such a, a deal. Problem. Oh, gosh. It's a deal. I could hear them. Yeah. I could hear them running back and forth. It's fine. Uh, so they're alive. Okay. <laughs> at least, most at least of one, them. Of them. one of them. At is. least one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So, uh, you, very good. And also, again, if you uh, tune into D to Dean's channel, Dean Lentini on YouTube, he's going to have a live video that he does uh, this coming Monday. Yes. And uh, he he mm -hmm. has not determined the exact time, but he will he will. That's why you got to subscribe. You yeah, got to subscribe to know when he's. <laughs> it's all when his kids allow him to do it <laughs> yeah that's, that's pretty much what it, it is yeah. It. yeah we all understand all of us are fathers here so we know that uh a lot is dictated by the schedule of our family so i appreciate both of you appreciate both of you taking time out of your schedule to do this and for sure i hope you have a wonderful rest of your week thanks brother you got it thank you friend